Now it is my great pleasure to introduce you to Susan Snell, our archivist at the Museum of Freemasonry. And Susan will be giving us a talk about Bartholomew Ruspini, who is also the topic of our new special exhibition at the Museum of, Re of Freemasonry. Susan, we are so excited to hear more. I will hand over to you. Thank you very much, Jane, and hello to everybody. The Museum of Freemasonry is delighted to welcome you back after lockdown with a fascinating new exhibition which has just opened in the library. The presentation introduces a new display for anyone planning to visit the museum. However, for anyone unable to visit London at the present time, my talk introduces the remarkable life and contributions to society of Bartholomew Ruspini, an 18th century Freemason, celebrity dentist and philanthropist. Described by one writer as Italian by birth, an Englishman by choice and a Freemason by heart, Ruspini was a charismatic and affable man whose legacies include helping to transform dental care in Britain and setting up a school for the Daughters of Freemasons, still open today. He started a series of annual concerts to raise funds for the school, which developed later into the Freemasons Festival programme, which continues to raise money for charities. Bartholomew Ruspini was born into a noble but impoverished family in a small village in the mountainous northeast of Italy. This was not far from Bergamo, where he claimed to have studied medicine in the 1740s. It's not certain whether he qualified in full as a doctor, but Ruspini then decided to travel to Paris, where the French capital was emerging as the center of a new specialism, dentistry. Oops. There we go. By the mid 18th century, sugar consumption and mercury based cures for venereal diseases were causing considerable problems for European teeth. The first dentistry textbooks appeared in France, such as Pierre Fourchard's influential Le Chirurgien Dentiste in 1728, emphasizing a new approach in caring and preserving rather than pulling out rotten teeth. French ideas about how to conduct yourself influenced 18th century personal cleanliness. Everyone became more aware of appearance, smell, and the importance of smiling in social situations than ever before. Paris led the way by including teeth in portraits and developing porcelain replacements for those lacking the required Hollywood smiles. The modern trend for white pearly teeth is nothing new. 18th century dentists like Ruspini, who trained with the Parisian specialist Catalan, advised patients to use mouthwash, tooth powder, known as dentifrice, which would have been kept in the silver box on the left, and toothbrushes. And although it's lacking its bristles, um, this toothbrush may well be the first commercially available toothbrush to survive, imprinted on the stem with the name Ruspini. You can find out more about the 18th century dental revolution in September when I discussed this in conversation with Professor Colin Jones. Meanwhile, Ruspini came to England to try and establish dental services in fashionable towns where few practitioners offered similar skills. He provided dental services in York by the early 1750s, emphasizing his Parisian links in advertisements as British awareness of French dentistry expertise grew. By January 1756, a Signor Ruspini, an operator for the teeth, mentioned his intention to settle in the London press. The next year, Ruspini married Elizabeth Stiles, 
described as an agreeable widow possessed of a fortune of 250 pounds per annum at St Bartholomew the Great, London. Ruspini announced that he was available for consultations near the Haymarket and at the Union Coffee House in the city. However, Ruspini experienced difficulties in establishing a London base and relocated to Bath, a popular resort with the second largest number of dentists in England. The town attracted many wealthy patrons and residents requiring dental treatment, made worse by the growing 18th century addiction to Caribbean sugar. His first dentistry advert appeared in the Bath Journal in 1758, when Ruspini announced that he would wait on patients at the shortest notice and offering tooth whitening tooth powder guaranteed to avoid problems caused by scurvy. Ruspini settled in the town, lodging in rooms in the smart Queen Square, shown here with the lovely obelisk in the centre, which was dedicated to Frederick, Prince of Wales, um, who was also a Freemason. But Ruspini travelled up to London in the summer. Five retail establishments, including three bath milliners, a ladies' tea room at the Hotwells, Bristol, and George's Coffee House in London's West End sold his tooth powder. Ruspini tried to join a lodge, meeting at the White Bear in Bath, later Royal Cumberland Lodge, but was unsuccessful. The minutes loaned by the lodge for display in the exhibition record Mr. Bartholomew Ruspini was balloted for in a full lodge and three balls being found in the negative drawer Therefore, he is handsomely prorogued, i.e. held over, for three months. Bear Lodge, the most popular and oldest lodge of Freemasons in Bath, introduced several new bylaws aimed at restricting membership, one stating that any rejected candidate could not be readmitted. Ruspini took lodgings near the Cross Bath, but travelled often on business between Bath, Bristol and London. Not put off, Ruspini realised his aim to join Freemasonry in April 1762. He was initiated in the lodge meeting at the Bush Tavern, Bristol. He didn't go to many lodge meetings as he continued to travel on business. He went to Dublin to help his student, Mr Berg, to set up a dental surgery. He returned to Bath but continued to support Berg by endorsing his dental services revealing the importance of the Ruspini brand by this date. Ruspini's hard work attracted affluent patients and Ruspini set up his base in London after the death of his first wife in September 1766. The following year, Ruspini remarried, taking his, as his second bride, Elizabeth Ord, the daughter of a Northumberland nobleman at St. James's Westminster. During a long and successful marriage, the couple raised nine children. Ruspini gained the patronage of Augusta, the mother of King George III, and rented a house opposite Carlton House, the London base of the Prince of Wales in Pall Mall. As Ruspini's dentistry took off, he continued to supply his tooth powder mouthwash and a mysterious liquid able to stop bleeding, known as a styptic, to shops in Bath, Bristol and Dublin. His kindness ensured that supplies were provided to less affluent Londoners from an, apoth from an apothecary shop in Cripplegate. Ruspini published a treatise on the teeth in 1768, which ran into 15 editions, soon followed by a concise relation of the effects of an extraordinary styptic. The exhibition display includes early printed editions of both works on loan from the British Dental Association and the Wellcome Collection. The treatise was not entirely new, and reveals the influence of Fourchard and other dental pioneers, such as Royal Society member Frederick Hoffman. 
However, the treatise provided the first popular work on dental care published in England and included numerous testimonies from influential people helped by Ruspini's products. Both publications were part of Ruspini's skillful advertising strategy and drew attention to his styptic, which stopped bleeding. This miraculous liquid, which provided treatments for mouth ulcers and helped tooth implantation, was endorsed by the Royal Navy. The dentist guarded the secret recipe closely, but left instructions on how to make it in an envelope as specified in his will for his eldest son, James Bladen Ruspini. Bottles were shipped overseas of the styptic and Mrs. Eliza Ruspini wrote a letter in 1786, which is on loan from the Royal Academy for our exhibition, to an artist and family friend, Isaias Humphrey. She informed him that he could even obtain styptic supplies endorsed by the East India Company in Bengal. Oops, there we go. Cases containing the Rispini branded tooth powder, mouthwash and styptic were sold to wealthy patients. A fine mahogany example from Surgeons Hall Museums, Edinburgh, is included in the exhibition. Ruspini also tried to help the Italian opera singer and impresario, Teresa Cornelis, who held mass balls and lavish entertainments at Carlisle House at Slo Soho Square. She was imprisoned for bankruptcy in the 1790s and suffered from breast cancer, but Ruspini's styptic helped to relieve her painful symptoms. Ruspini's growing reputation for dentistry in the 1770s and 1780s is revealed in satirical comments in the press and poems. A parody of a fashionable bath guidebook includes a fictional exchange of letters and refers to dentures made by Ruspini for Miss Polly Patton. Polly, toast of Lombard Street, how she views her little feet, with what an air, she waves her head, her eyes how black, her lips how red, how white her teeth, bewitching jade, the best Rispini ever made. The dentist made sets of dentures from hippopotamus ivory for the Prince of Wales, and provided special ceramic rests, which came to be known as Rispini holders. These were an improvement on the wooden dentures worn by the American Freemason, George Washington, but Rispini also obtained expensive porcelain dentures from France, which included mechanical hinges. Such dentures sometimes sprung from the mouths of unsuspecting guests, to the amusement of fellow diners. And we can just imagine some of these dentures escaping across the table. Rispini was also involved in the practice of transplanting teeth from chimney sweeps and others into the mouths of those able to afford this painful remedy. Soon after establishing a base in London, and as his dental business took off, Ruspini joined Royal Lodge and Morningbush Lodge, later Lodge of Emulation. He also joined St Albans Lodge and Lodge of Antiquity, acting as a peacemaker to reunite the members in 1790 and was later made an honorary member. Although he joined several other lodges meeting under the Modern's Grand Lodge, Ruspini also joined the Ancient's Grand Master's Lodge with its minute book on display in the exhibition. He was a dedicated Freemason and a founder of Lodge of the Nine Muses, which attracted several Italian members, many from noble and artistic circles. In 1786, the Prince of Wales had a serious nosebleed while returning from the Newmarket races and his life was saved by Ruspini's styptic. In consequence, 
Respini was appointed surgeon dentist to the Royal Air. The next year, the Grand Master, the Duke of Cumberland, introduced the prince, his nephew, to Freemasonry. Ruspini and two others applied for a dispensation to form Prince of Wales's Lodge for members with appointments to the prince's household. The petition, which survives in the Prince of Wales Lodge minute book on display in the exhibition, is signed by Ruspini, the grand portrait painter, Matthew Peters, and Johann or Louis Welcher, a Bavarian chef who ran the Carlton House and Brighton Pavilion households for the Prince of Wales. In 1791, the Prince of Wales, now Grand Master, in succession to his uncle, appointed Ruspini as Grand Sword Bearer, Bearer and Ruspini paid for the sword to be repaired and embellished. Ruspini also joined a chapter as a Royal Arch Freemason with three others at a meeting in the King's Arms in 1772. His Royal Arch Companion's Jewel survives and continues to be worn at meetings of the Prince of Wales's chapter, as we can see here in this image. He was appointed a steward responsible for organizing the Grand Feast and Ruspini's outgoing personality proved an asset. As master of ceremonies, he organized a grand chapter ball attended by 400 members and guests. An accomplished dancer, Ruspini led the festivities. He was thanked for his services and was reappointed as master of ceremonies until the 1790s. Ruspini joined several chapters and was made an honorary member of Chapter of St. James, whose minute book is included in the exhibition. Ruspini provided drawings for new ceremonial robes for Royal Arch principles, worn right up until the formation of the Supreme Grand Chapter in 1817. Ruspini was a benevolent person who hosted magnificent dinners at his home in Pall Mall, as a letter on display invites the Grand Secretary to a fine turtle dinner. This fashionable and expensive treat indicates Ruspini's prosperity and lifestyle by this date. The Ruspini family formed a wide coterie of artistic friends in London and was involved in other interesting activities. In 1777, Ruspini launched a lottery scheme with a cabinet made by Michelangelo in 1510 listed as one of the prizes. It's not known who won the cabinet and other items, but this hints at a continuing relationship with his family back in Italy. It is known that a portrait of, of Ruspini and his family by Sir William Beechey remained at the family home in Romocolo until at least 1905, but its present whereabouts remains unknown. It became popular during the age of benevolence to support charities. Ruspini was a committee member and benefactor of several. As a patron of the philanthropic, later the Royal Philanthropic Society, he arranged a benefit night at the Royal Circus Equestrian and Philharmonic Academy, which raised over 30 pounds. For assisting Italians and other Europeans arriving in England, Ruspini was created a Chevalier of the Order of the Golden Spur by the Pope in 1789. He obtained a coat of arms and the design with his title Chevalier appeared on all his dental products and publicity with the motto Deo et Amicis, which is Latin for God and friends. Given his sociability, generosity and keenness to help others, it's unsurprising that Ruspini instigated a new charity aimed at maintaining, clothing and educating the female children of Freemasons needing support. As a father raising four sons and five daughters with his second wife, Elizabeth, 
Rispini's awareness of the vulnerability of children influenced his aim to help. Rispini issued a prospectus for the school, supported by royal patrons and many other Freemasons, aimed at educating and maintaining 15 daughters of members. As institutor of the school, Rispini drew upon his connections with members of the Lodge of Nine Muses and Prince of Wales's Lodge to provide administrative support for the new charity. To raise funds, Rispini organized annual concerts with the girls singing a verse written by the poet, Anna Jane Vardil, set to music by Dr. Samuel R. Arnold, the organist at Westminster Abbey. These annual concerts form the basis for the present day festivals arranged by Freemasons to raise funds for charities and to provide support to communities at home and overseas. Although Rispini's scheme proved unpopular to some, as five shillings was added to the initiation fee paid by new members, his fundraising scheme was successful. Two and a half thousand pounds were raised in the first three years, and by the close of the century, the school supported more than 50 girls. The school moved to a new purpose-built building in Southwark, opened in 1795, and then relocated to larger premises at Clapham Junction in the 1850s. Since 1933, it has occupied a rural site in Rickmansworth, Hertfordshire, where the school continues to provide education for girls. A preschool at the Rickmansworth site was named after Rispini, and a block of flats, Rispini House, provides accommodation for the children of Freemasons moving to London to study or work. Rispini Lodge, in the order of Mark Masonry, continues to honour Rospini by hosting lun annual luncheons. The Masonic Charitable Foundation, its successor, now helps around 2,000 children needing support. Rospini died in 1813, just as the Ancients and Moderns Grand Lodges were forming the United Grand Lodge of England. His funeral was attended by girls from the school wearing black cloaks. Sadly, his gravestone was lost during World War II, but Freemasons contributed to a memorial tablet placed in St. James's Church Piccadilly in 2013. Today, we remember Rispini as an innovative Freemason and dentist whose remarkable achievements continue to contribute to the charitable aims of Freemasonry. Thank you for listening. There's a chance to book and see the exhibition from Monday to Saturday before and up to the 7th of February 2022. And if you want to know some more, um, our next webinar will be on the 8th of June. I'm hoping to have a conversation with Professor Colin Jones in uh, the autumn. And you can also have a chance to have a look at our previous webinar about the schools in my colleague Louise's Pichel uh, webinar, which is available on our YouTube channel. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Susan. <laughs> Bravo. Thank you. If you have a question for Susan, then please post it in the chat. It would be lovely to hear from you. Susan, thank you so much. There are so many aspects to this man uh, that we will try and get around, but <laughs> let's start at the beginning. That's always a good place to start. Now, why did he come to England in the first place? The answer is we don't know. I don't think he actually completed his medical training in Bergamo and suddenly got itchy feet and haired off to Paris. Now, we don't know why, uh, perhaps he was a bit of a black sheep in the family. We, we don't know that. Perhaps he had blotted his coffee book or perhaps he just genuinely had itchy feet and wanted to explore new horizons. And after training in Paris, he began to see where he might be able to establish himself. 
And we think that's why he started to come over to England in the 1750s. Ah, that's really interesting. Let, let's dwell a bit on, on his dentistry uh, there, Susan. I remember when we, when we prepared for this exhibition, you and I, and we were working on it, we, we had some quite interesting discussions about how dentistry was viewed at the time as a practice. And I also remember we, we sometimes came across reference to him being uh, described as a doctor. And I guess sometimes even today we see dentists a, a little bit as a kind of doctor uh, or people working in medicine. But um, do we know if he was qualified as a dentist? And if so, how, how did you qualify to become a dentist at the time? Well, it all started in Paris, where you had experts such as Caporon. Um, but we think he, according to Rispini's son, James Bladen Rispini, he was also a dentist. Um, he trained with somebody called Catalan. And um, he must have received some sort of certificate or uh, qualification because he definitely um, emphasized his Parisian credentials in any advertising after he came to England. Uh -huh. An interesting question in relation to that, Susan, in, in the chat here. What was his relationship with other dentists? Do we know if he, if he had social relationship with other dentists? We don't know. Um, so much about Rispini is as yet unknown. So I'm hoping that other people will become interested and try and find out some of these answers. There, um, the highest number of dentists in England in the 18th century was in London. And this then uh, distinguishes them from tooth pullers or tooth drawers, as they were known, but it's the French that coined the term dentiste or dentiste. And then in Bath, there was the second highest number of practicing dentists. But that's not surprising because Bath was a town or city with um, lots of retired army and navy um, personnel um, who were older, who'd, whose teeth may have been ravaged through scurvy and other disorders and from having too much sugar. So um, that's why we think he headed to Bath. Uh, another question in the chat, Susan, it wasn't just anyone who could call themselves a dentist back then. Well, it wasn't until much later that you actually had to prove your dentistry by undertaking a, a qualification. And so that wasn't until the 19th century. Until up to then, the way into the profession was becoming an apprentice to a dentist. And we've seen that Rispini had an apprentice, uh, Mr. Berg, who he later helped to set up in Dublin. Ah, very good. Well, we also know that he was a bit of a, an inventor because you mentioned the styptic there. Now, wh what exactly was that and how did it work? Now, I have been able to find the recipe and sadly, I forgot to double check it before tonight. So apologies for that. But it was um, some sort of chemicals that were mixed together with balsam, balsamic vinegar, I think. And that was used. But I can remember as a young child, my grandfather and my father having a little sort of like pencil thing which they called a styptic which as a child I thought sounded a bit like septic and I didn't understand but this is what they use when they cut themselves shaving and they would just apply the styptic stick and that would stop the bleeding so it's been used uh, a styptic and until fairly recently and I'm sure some of our younger members might who might be uh, on this call might be able to tell us what they use now <laughs> if they're not growing beards. Yeah. Ah, here's a very interesting question, Susan, that uh, relating to one of those last slides you so showed us uh, with the, the picture of him uh, with the schoolgirls. Do we know who's depicted on the Rispini print, uh, the pupils at the schoolgirl? Um, it, it, it's behind the Grandmaster uh, on the left. Uh, do we know who's there? 
we do know who most of the people in that engraving, which is actually taken uh, from an actual painting done by Thomas Stoddart, and then the engraving is done by Bartolozzi and was done to actually raise funds uh, for the school. But we do know who most of the people in the uh, engraving are. And if you look on our website, we've got an exciting new interactive that you can have a go at and um, have a look at some of the people and find out a bit more about them. We've called it 18th century celebrity spotting. So um, have a go and see what you think of our latest uh, interactive. It's fun to have a try. I, I'm very happy you mentioned that, Susan, because it is great fun. So do do log onto the website and have a look at that. You can click on the different people on, on the image and actually read a lot more about them. There's some amazing information there put together by, by Susan. So an amazing little, uh, little interactive there. Uh, Susan, let's go into some of his charity work a little bit. Um, there were some uh, some interesting uh, things he supported, obviously the girls' school and so on, but it seems like he was also a little bit into the arts. I know you mentioned yeah. an opera singer, for example. Yes, um, well, he was a great supporter of other Italians in London. So in the Lodge of the Nine Muses, we have people like uh, Bartolozzi, Car the architect Carlini, and uh, another engraver, um, Cipriani, or painter Cipriani, who did some wonderful um, like cartouches for candlesticks for the Lodge of Nine Muses. And um, they really are nice and did some of the jewels as well for the Lodge of N Nine Muses. Um, we know that he supported many Italians in London and encouraged them, which I think actually shows how difficult, it reflects how difficult he found it when he tried to settle in London and wanted to help others. Mm, true, true. And, you know, he did support a lot of people in the artistic community in London. So wherever he could, he would encourage them to join lodges. And also, if there was any work available, he would certainly suggest to them that they might be interested in doing some engravings for Grand Lodge or uh, for tickets for the concerts and things like that. That's very good. Susan, I actually have an interesting comment, not a question, but a comment in, in, the, uh, in the chat here I thought you want to know about. The diptych stick you mentioned was used up until recent time, but known as diptych pencil. Yes. That's, <laughs> that's an interesting. Yes. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you for that. For <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, Susan, another question in the chat. Were there any other dentists in the Prince of Wales Lodge? Um, I need to double check and see, but certainly three of Ruspini's four sons became dentists and practiced in their own right. Uh, but the eldest son definitely practiced with Ruspini, his father. Uh, and, that, oh, sorry. I was just going to say that James Ray, uh, Bladen Ruspini also became surgeon dentist to the Prince of Wales as well as his father. I was just about to ask about his family, uh, Susan. Do, do we know anything else uh, about his family? You mentioned he was married twice, I think. Yes, he doesn't seem to have had children with his first wife, but had nine with his second wife. Um, I've mentioned James Bladen Rispini, and it's really quite sad because uh, Rispini ve left very little money in his will because he had been so generous throughout his life. He hadn't saved anything as an inheritance for his family. And they had to abandon the house in Pall Mall not long after Rispini's death in 1813. But the eldest son became bankrupt by the 1820s. And it's quite an irony that James Bladen's Rispini's two daughters, Agnes and I can't remember the name of the other little girl, but they both attended um, the school. So they had the advantage of what their grandfather had set up. Oh, I see. 
Um, so you mentioned um, our assistant archivist Louise's talk there about the girls' school. Do uh, do have a look at that. It's on our uh, our YouTube channel and our website um, if you want to know more about about the school. Um, but Susan, uh, here towards the end, apart from our obvious excellent exhibition in the library at the Museum of Freemasonry, that goes without saying, where can people go to find out more about Ruspini? Well, if you would like to come in and register as a researcher, you can come and have a look at uh, all the articles about him and um, some of the archives that we have in the collection that reveal more about him and also the early history of the school because we do have um, the charity, the school charity records on deposit uh, in the archive from the uh, Masonic Charitable Foundation. And the rest of it you can pick up um, by searching online and finding out more. There is more information out there about the lottery and the uh, Michelangelo cabinet and other aspects of Ruspini's life. And also, I'd like to briefly mention the British Dental Association, who have some other items. And I'd really like to thank them at this point and all the other people who have loaned resources for our exhibition. We wouldn't have been able to have done that without them. Fantastic, Susan. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, we are running out of time, but I'm just going to squeeze one more question in from the chat. There is a very specific one here for you, Susan. Given his Italian origins, did Ruspini happen to meet Catliostro uh, when uh, he came to London, or is there evidence that they met? Who knows? Um, we'll have to double check that and see whether there is uh, a likelihood of that. I, I think Ruspini was a very... Um, Modern's Grand Lodge Freemason and wanted to, because he had, uh, you know, he'd come to London, had to set up home and a business. He wanted to obey all the rules and uh, not get um, sidelined into any um, other type of Freemasonry that might have been going on. Very, very interesting. Susan, thank you so, so much. We are running out of time. A huge thank you to Susan for a fantastic talk and to Louise for technical support. And of course, to all of you for joining us and for your questions tonight. Uh, we hope you will consider joining, joining us again for another live webinar. We will be back on Tuesday, the 8th of June at 7.30 p.m. British time with our librarian, Martin Cherry, for a talk about frontispieces from the Books of Constitution. So please join us. It will be very interesting. The link to register is already available on our website. So for now, thank you so much for joining us and have a nice evening. Thank you.